Okay. I've got a question for you. Is there a cure for the chaos of life? Is there a solution to worry and fear? Is there a cure for the chaos of life? Is there a solution to worry and fear? Keep that question in the back of your mind as we continue today. Um, in, region, in a region of Mexico, uh, actually all over Mexico, they have hot springs. And in some regions, uh, they have a hot and cold springs side by each. And, um, and because of the convenience of that natural phenomenon, the families from the community often bring their laundry and they boil their clothes in the hot spring and then they rinse them in the cold spring. And uh, a tourist watched this procedure and commented to, uh, to his uh, Mexican guide, he said, wow, they must think Mother Nature is generous to freely supply such ample, clean, and hot water. The guide replied, no, senor, there is much grumbling because she does not supply the soap. <clears throat> what lens do you look at life through? Do you have gratitude for all that you have? Or do you tend to focus on what you don't have? Is life a problem to solve? Or is it a, a, a mystery to explore? Is life one hardship after the other with little rest in between? Or is life a blessing? Another way of asking this question is, how is your internal dialogue? What is your self-talk like? Um, in the day-to-day, -day, does your life s seem to you, to yourself, and perhaps to others, to be a life that expresses thanksgiving? The theme of giving thanks, of, of having gratitude, uh, is all over the Bible. It's all over Scripture. And, and um, it's this reminder to remember good things and to do so often and with genuine gratitude, right? So pretending to be thankful or just saying those words uh, means nothing. But, but uh, there's this constant reminder throughout Scripture to be thankful. And then we actually see it as well. Um, now, in the Bible, if, if you're familiar with, if you spend much time in Scripture, you'll notice that you don't find anyone having a particularly pleasant time. You don't find people having a particularly pleasant time. You don't find people who are living lives of leisure, who are being encouraged to think positively about their circumstance. You just don't find that. Like for most humans in most of human history, Life has been a huge struggle, and suffering has been great. So what you find in the Bible is troubled people, hurting people, living under internal and then external oppression. The internal stuff is kind of the oppression of sin that everyone struggles with, and external things can be like uh, things going on, like what's happening in, in the Ukraine right now, uh, you know, oppressive um, political regimes, wars, things like that. So there's always been stuff going on on the inside of people, and then there's always been kind of the chaos of, of the external world, and, um, and that's just been... We have that today, and of course, we have that back, back then. And then in the Bible, you also find people who are living in exile. They are living in a place that they don't want to be. Um, you find people living far from home, uh, far from comfort. Uh, you find people suffering, suffering in exile. You find people, as you read Scripture, who are sick. You find people who are needy. You find people who are at the end of themselves. And then more often than not, you find those people who are at the end of themselves are crying out to God in desperation. And so that's kind of what you find in the Bible. And it's not really different from what we find in our world today, as I said. It's not really so different from the way most people on this planet live and live. And, and perhaps it's not really so different 
from our own lives. And all those people in Scripture, just like all of us in this church, are encouraged to give thanks. Now, someone might say, well, you know, that's rich. Um, we might even be inclined to react badly when we hear about this idea of thanksgiving. We might complain long and hard about how truly miserable and impossible our situation, and then how the call to be thankful in the midst of that really offers no solution at all. It's no help or use at all. And some might say that the, the call of God in Scripture to be thankful is completely unreasonable and maybe even unkind. Again, that can come out of, and I've seen that come out of the heart of a soul that is truly hurting. And it's true that thanksgiving is not a concrete solution to any problem. It's not about fixing stuff that's not right, per se. But thankfulness is a call to live with a different perspective. It's a call to live with a different perspective. And that's just a different way of looking at life, a different way of seeing what we see, and, and a different way of looking at the challenges that life happens to be throwing at us right now. And there is no doubt that for many of us on this planet, including many of us here, much of life, or at least part, parts of life, are incredibly difficult. That's just a reality. It's a common suffering is kind of the universal norm. But God offers another way. God offers another way. Um, a bunch of us in this congregation have been reading through the whole Bible for uh, a number of years now, actually. And, and of course, that includes the Old Testament. And uh, the Old Testament is extremely good to read. But if you have much empathy, uh, and if you're kind of able to enter into the story, the amount of drama and suffering and hardship that are in the narratives, in the accounts, in the Old Testament can be a little overwhelming. The scripture that Jonathan read uh, is found around the middle of the Bible in a book that's really a song book, actually, uh, simply called the Book of Psalms. And the Psalms, like many others, uh, or, or the psalm that, we're look, that we looked at today that Jonathan read, um, like a lot of the other psalms, was written by King David. Uh, King David was a fella who did not have an easy life on any level. As a young kid, he did hard work as a shepherd. He was the youngest of a bunch of brothers, and, um, uh, and he, he was a shepherd. Also, while quite young, he had been actually pronounced king, had been made king, technically, uh, but in reality, he was hunted like a dog by the person who was the current king of Israel, right? So he was promised, a divine promise that he would be king, which is great news, right? But instead, he had to put all of his energies for years into not getting killed by the current king, Saul, who was kind of loopy. David's son rebelled against him, making his life miserable. David himself did some terrible things uh, to seriously hurt others, and he also suffered from the consequences of his own actions. And so, so David was a fella who was familiar with hardship. He was familiar with misery. He was familiar with living in impossible situations for prolonged periods of time. He knew suffering. Some of that suffering, uh, you know, he was like an innocent in that suffering. He, was, he suffered at the hands of evil people. And some of that suffering he caused himself. He was the agent of his own suffering. Uh, he was responsible for it. And yet, in the midst of that whole kind of world of David's, he wrote this. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Right? This is not so much, you know, encouragement to have a general sense of thankfulness. Uh, I've, I've heard people kind of um, resist the idea of giving thanks under all circumstances for good reason, right? So in many circumstances, in many things that happen in life, there is actually very little or maybe nothing at all to be thankful for in the circumstances themselves, right? So when somebody that you love is suffering, when someone that you love dies, uh, 
when you're desperately struggling to make ends meet, when there's way too much month at the end of the money, we're likely not going to want to give thanks in that situation. But as this passage invites us to do, regardless of what's happening around us, regardless of our circumstances, we can give thanks to God. Why? Because He is good. His love never fails. It lasts forever. In other words, God is not the problem. God is never the problem. And if we're inclined to think that somehow God is the problem, if we're inclined to blame God, we really need to think again. The truth is that the circumstances that we face, the difficulties that we face, are never greater than God. Are we just saying, how great is our God? How great is our God? The circumstances that we, never face, that we face are never greater than God. But that's like words on a page, right? Or words on the screen. Living this, living this truth can require an attitude adjustment. It sure did, and it sure does for me. And it's pretty kind of simple Right? So if we keep our eyes focused on our circumstances, we will have a very up and down, roller coaster like experience of life. Anybody here over 50 who likes roller coasters? Maybe a few of us? I stopped liking them like about when I turned 50, actually. <laughs> it became just like really, really hard on my stomach. Um, so, yeah, if we keep our eyes focused on what's going on now, the hardships that we're facing, if that's what we're thinking about constantly, we're going to be just up and down like crazy, right? But if we keep our eyes focused on the fact that God is good and his love is never withdrawn, his love endures forever, as the scripture says, we will lead simply much more grounded lives, meaning that the external world might be going up and down like this, but we will be much, much more steady and stable on the inside. And that will impact our world, and that will impact all those that we are in touch with. So remember, King David wrote this uh, psalm, right? And, and as when he wrote most of the, the psalms that he, he, he wrote, his world was very topsy-turvy. It was very complicated. It was full of stress, and, and, and he had a ton of external reasons to fret, right? But David stayed grounded on the inside by remembering to give thanks to God and by living with this attitude of gratefulness to God. He always knew that God was not the problem. His internal self-talk, his internal dialogue stayed strongly focused on God in a disciplined way, meaning that it's not easy. You don't just decide one second I'm going to do it, and all of a sudden, without thinking, you have to do it. It's actually an applied discipline. He, he stayed strongly focused on God. He ordered his life so that he was going to be able to do that. And largely because of that, he was able to overcome all of the hardships that he faced in life. His life was way more complicated than most people's lives. And then he said this, let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story, those he redeemed from the hand of the foe, those he gathered from the lands east and west, north and south, wandered in desert wastelands, finding no way to a city where they could settle, right? Let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story, right? So you've got a story. You've got a story. Tell your story. If you've been a follower of Jesus for more than a couple of days, you have an experience already of God's faithfulness and God's goodness. You have an experience already of God's grace and mercy. And life, for sure, has thrown you curves. You might be suffering right here, right now. There may be suffering among those you love. That's probably harder, right? Like, like it's, we suffer ourselves and we kind of adapt, but it's really, really hard to watch those we love suffering. But the reality is you likely do, for sure, positively, you do have a story of God doing something marvelous, something miraculous, something unexpected in your life. 
But here's the funny thing. <clears throat> Whenever God does things like I just described, he always cloaks them in coincidence. He always cloaks them in coincidence. That's his way of giving you permission and the opportunity to exercise faith and then to proclaim that God has been at work in your life. Or, on the other hand, to exercise doubt and to continue to practice being skeptical, right? He's giving you the permission to exercise faith or to not do so, right? It's his way of letting you exercise free will in the day to day, in the moment by moment. Up until I was 17 years old, I had lived my life as an atheist. My entire world was surrounded by atheists. My family were atheists. I had no knowledge of or respect for or care for God because I was sure that he didn't exist. I knew it. A month after I came to Christ, obviously I'm missing a whole lot of story there, but a month after I came to Christ, a month after I became a Christian, I'm, I'm crossing uh, the street at Danforth and Coxwell, and, um, and this total stranger stops me in the middle of the road at the intersection, and he looks at me, and he just says, are you a Christian? I was very surprised. I couldn't make any sense out of it. And I simply said, yes. And he said something like, cool. And then he walked away, and I never saw him again. Was that a coincidence? Was that God showing himself to me, reinforcing the reality of his love, the reality of his existence, when I was a very young and tender Christian? Right? So it's actually up to me to decide. I can go either way. Was it a coincidence, or was it God's hand at work in my life in a tiny little way that was, you know, for me, very significant? So it's up to us how we are going to interpret the coincidences in our life. And I am 100% positive that all of us have a whole bunch of coincidences in our life that we scratch our heads at and wonder, what was that about? What was that about, right? So it's up to, it's up to us to figure out how to interpret stuff like that. But here's the thing. God will never, whoops, hang on. God will never force the reality of his existence upon anyone, right? He will never create a single incident that gives undeniable or ir irrefutable evidence that he exists. He will always let us choose to believe and to live as though we believe or to not believe and to live as though we don't believe. So when you tell your story, and the scripture is encouraging us to tell our story, you don't do it as proof of God's reality, but you simply do it as evidence that's very personal that somebody might listen to, right? So, so just to kind of reinforce this, so the presence of God literally among us in Jesus Christ performing all kinds of impossible miracles, which is as close as anyone can possibly get to like perfect proof, that did not convince everyone, right? Some who, who saw those miracles were convinced and they followed Jesus because of his miracles. And because of the same exact miracles, others decided that Jesus needed to die. So you're not responsible for the way others respond to your testimony because their hearts and the work of God in that person's life determines that, right? So, but we, but we do need to share our story, right? We need to, need to be sure to tell our story when we get opportunities, right? And, and for anyone who truly follows Jesus, there will always be a genuine testimony of God's faithfulness and goodness. It's unavoidable because God is faithful and God is good. And so the psalm actually continues with the story of how God delivered his people. Um, that's really the same as, as a lot of the Old Testament. Um, you know, and we think of our own lives. Did God, did God deliver you from a life of waste and shame? Uh, tell your story. Has he healed you 
Tell your story. Remember when Lori first came to us, she told us how she had a long a challenge with addiction, and she got delivered on the way from Kingston to Toronto uh, in a van, it's kind of unexpectedly, right? Uh, and this addiction that had gripped her life disappeared, gone, right? And, and I heard that story first 20-odd like, years ago. I've told it to a whole lot of people since then, by the way. Um, um, you know, stories have a tendency to, to you know, continue. Um, but, um, but tell your story. Right? Tell, tell the story of God's healing work in your life. Um, you know, has God been present maybe to you from the cradle? Right? Maybe your parents were faithful to live as good examples of what it truly means to God. And they noticed you know, that they, they paid attention. And, and maybe that, um, uh, sorry, just try to make sense of that. Um, maybe if your parents gave you a good example of what, what it's like that it left an impression on you that it inspired you then also to commit your life to Christ, right? So that's, that's kind of, we have a, a cradle Christians uh, who were raised in the faith and who then obviously made a choice to continue following Jesus. And then you have people like me who were kind of born on the wrong side of the tracks who God nevertheless wooed into the kingdom, right? So then we have this ongoing story talking about the people of God. They were hungry and thirsty. Their lives ebbed away. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way to a city where they could settle. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind, humankind, for he satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry with good things. So the Bible is full of stories of people who struggled, people just like me and you. And they, just like you and me, were frankly inclined more easily and naturally to complain, right? Complaining was more natural, more uh, just, just easier than any kind of thanksgiving. Their lens was likely clouded with seeing life as a problem to solve, right? One hardship after the other with little rest in between. More than likely then, of course, their internal self-talk before they verbalized their complaint was probably pretty negative too. We have the thought, then we speak the thought, right? So filled with worry and fear and with thoughts like, I can't do this, this mountain is just too hard to climb, that's the state that folks were in, right? I've told the story of how my brother was once asked, uh, do you see life as a cup half full or half empty? Do you see life as a cup half full or half empty? And he said that he saw his life as being a cup overflowing, overflowing with blessing, overflowing with love, overflowing with God's grace. And he said that knowing that in a few months he would die of cancer. And he said that as he looked back at his life as a young guy, 54, his life that he, he knew that God had filled with joy and purpose. He said that as he anticipated the end of his own earthly life and the one that continues beyond this one. Colossians says this, so then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness, right? May you and I choose to live thankfully. Thankfulness is, in fact, a big part of the cure for worry and for misery and for fear and for the chaos that surrounds us. A commitment to being people of thanksgiving means that we make the conscious choice that because God loves us, because God is good, our cups are overflowing. Our cups are overflowing. And we need to sometimes work on our internal self-talk and perhaps work on our connection with God so that we can come to that place where we can see that our lives are overflowing. The root of joy is gratefulness, right? So it's not joy that makes us grateful, it's gratefulness that makes us joyful. 
starts with gratefulness. May we be mindful that God is never absent from our lives. God is never the problem. And in fact, God wants more and more to be central in our thoughts and evident in all of our actions and words. And may we be careful with our internal dialogue, with the conversation we have with ourselves. And as a result of that care, may we find that what comes out of our mouths is less and less complaining and more and more thanksgiving. Amen? Amen.